Despite having an overly simplified combat structure, Honkai Star Wars expanded rather impressively on the mechanics present within. The first year was aimed at giving players material to use by laying the groundwork for how to formulate the game's meta. Turn-based gameplay doesn't allow for much creative latitude on a character. What they can and cannot do is very cut and dry, running the risk of units of similar classes competing against each other for market share. One way they can circumvent this is by playing into the various gameplay elements within turn-based combat. Star Wars doesn't have that many so far, but there are quite a few, including but not limited to damage over time, follow-up attacks, break damage, ultimate damage, counter-attacks, single target, and multi-target. By tapping into a certain niche or gimmick, a multitude of DPS units can exist in the same plane without necessarily competing against each other directly. For how long, that depends on what direction the game goes. Having talked about Nihility and by extension damage over time back in March, the next mechanic I want to bring to light is follow-up which has seen many developments in recent updates and is getting no shortage of attention. These days either a new character will come out that has some kind of follow-up mechanic in their Musa, or content will be introduced that heavily favors them. Today we'll be discussing what makes follow-up attacks so good, what are some potential drawbacks to them, and my overall projections on them in the future meta. The term follow-up attack can be somewhat misleading as technically it comprises any offensive action that triggers automatically and independently from either the player or enemy's action, therefore ignoring turn order and not being classified as an action. The reason it's somewhat misleading is that the words follow-up imply consecutive actions, as in Zeela's resurgence would be more suited for the term given it takes place immediately after her regular action. But I'm just being pedantic. It's here that we encounter both the central theme and greatest strength of follow-up attacks. There are three different types of follow-up attacks that we know of so far. The first being counters. While multiple enemies have counter-attack based follow-ups, presently Clara and March are the only playable units capable of initiating a counter. Depending on how much you want to split hairs, you can also label Aventurine and Blade as counter-attacks, but those two are not solely reliant on getting attacked. In practice, there's no difference between a counter-attack and a follow-up, merely the activation requirement almost always entailing you or an ally getting struck by an attack. Incidentally, I can see this being a direction Hoyo could go in regards to conceptualizing these strategies. You could design many interesting interactions from counterattacks, and we've seen it before. At the beginning of Star Wars, Clara's DPS potential was well documented by theory crafters, possibly the highest in the game, even exceeding the likes of Sila, albeit the circumstances required to achieve this were onerous to say the least. The next type of follow-up is summons, units that can aid you in battle usually drawing from the summoner's current stats with the exception of speed. Summoned units appear and are treated as their own individual character per turn cycle. Upon commencement of their turn, they automatically perform an action. As of 2.2, we have only two summons, the Lightning Lord from Jinyuan and the adorable pet trotter Numbi from Topaz. Summons often make up the bulk of their respective caster's pressure. Not implying they don't have any of their own, it's just usually the characters designed around operating and optimizing the summon, much like a Beast Tamer or a Puppet Master archetype. There is a high likelihood that more summoned units will be made in the future with different functions. For example, a summon that can heal, buff, or debuff the team, or there could be a summon that can actually be interacted with by enemies, kind of like a decoy. In any case, both Jingyuan and Topaz evolve around empowering the summon's attack strength for when it becomes Lightning Lord and Numbi's turn. Finally, of course, we have regular follow-ups, wherein characters themselves dish out attacks upon meeting a certain condition. Some choose to prioritize quantity over quality, attacking many times in quick succession, where others prefer to go for strong single attacks to produce massive damage. An example of the former would be heard as legendary, which has enabled her to become one of the best units for wave clear. Another example would be Kafka's Towns, dealing follow-up damage and applying a dot following any of her allies' basic attacks. Something a bit more powerful would be Ratio's Talent. If he uses a skill or his teammates attack a target affected by his ultimate, he deals a massive burst of damage to that target. Blade's Talent also unleashes a strong follow-up attack against all enemies after sustaining damage or losing HP 5 times. You'll notice that follow-up attacks are predominantly passive in nature, ergo all of them belong to the wielder's talents. I mean, they have to be. Follow-up attacks by design occur without the player's own input. Or rather, they normally occur without the player's own input. Just like how Akron's E6 can convert her basic attack and skill damage into ultimate damage, in turn making it so anything that increases ultimate damage will also amplify the strength of her other moves, attacks can also be given the follow-up status. Topaz's skill damage is technically registered as a follow-up because she's not attacking. All she does is implant the proof of death status. It's Numpy who does the actual attacking. But with her A2 trace, her basic attack also transforms into a follow-up attack, making them the only two follow-up attacks that can be performed on demand. This enables her basic attack and skill to receive enhancements from both follow-up attack boosts and basic attack and skill boosts. Best of both worlds. Several units have actions that do not entail a straight-up attack, like how Fu Xuan can restore herself back to nearly full upon dropping below half HP, or Luo Cha doing something similar with his insurance policy. While I plan to mostly talk about follow-up attacks, I do feel it's necessary to include non-damaging effects too, as altogether they underline what makes the follow-up mechanic so powerful. 
In Lighter Star All being a turn-based scheme, there's only so much you can do at any given point in time. Therefore, making the most out of every turn is imperative to your survival and success in the endgame. Since follow-ups do not make use of one's action for that turn cycle, the main advantage of characters with one is that they essentially have the ability to act more than once per turn, significantly magnifying their uptime, potential, and efficiency that's otherwise inaccessible to those without a follow-up. This is not too different from damage over time compositions. Part of what makes Kafka and Black Swan freaks of nature in battle is that they can effectively output damage twice per turn, their own action, and the damage over time proc. Follow-ups behave in the same way. Jingyuan can strike all enemies of the skill and maybe layer his ultimate on top of that, and then Lightning Lord can do even more damage afterwards. Staggering one's attacks is notably useful in getting the highest return out of each action. For example, let's say you're fighting a boss who spawns a mook on the side and you're using Dr. Ratio, while other single target fighters like Yanqing have to burn two turns, one on the minion and the other on the actual boss, Ratio can achieve this in one turn using a skill to attack the minion and hopefully taking it out, upon which his follow-up attack will automatically redirect onto the boss. You can expand on this even further in Pure Fiction. An erudition unit without a follow-up attack would only be allowed to clear at most two waves per cycle, one using their skill and one using their ultimate. An erudition with the follow-up can clear many, many more. Using Himeko as an example, she can strike out a wave with her skill, and assuming three enemies get weakness broken, she can perform a follow-up attack on the next wave that spawns to hopefully insta-kill them, and then she can use her ultimate to wipe out the third wave that spawns, which if she can recharge her talent, it will activate once more to strike out the fourth wave. In a very theoretical scenario, if you can buff Himeko enough to where her talent can insta-break enemy toughness gauges from full while one-shotting the wave, Victory Rush will activate again and again and again and again. Mind you, this is an extremely theoretical scenario and currently impossible to achieve at the moment, but it highlights the main strength of follow-ups. If you can meet the activation requirement of the follow-up attack in question, you can potentially chain cast it endlessly, assuming of course there's no hard ones per turn. Accounting for the very real possibility that follow-up attacks can become excessively overpowered if unrestrained, limitations are typically given to stronger and more accessible ones. Ratio's follow-up can reach ludicrous amounts of damage, but much of its uptime is kept in check by the need to cast his ultimate which has a very exorbitant 140 energy cost. Should you have the means to refresh his ultimate before he runs out of wise man's folly, you have a hyper carry who can attack during his teammate's actions. There's no practical way to do this right now though, not without a suspicious star at least. Even so, if in the future Star L power creeps enough to where you can full charge ultimates without breaking a sweat, then units like Ratio and Topaz whose DPS is heavily reliant on their ultimates will get all the more powerful. The next benefit of follow-ups is that due to occurring outside of the character's action, it is a chance to come in clutch. Take Adventuring, though he's a tank and first and foremost concerned with protecting the team, he can do a fairly decent amount of damage if you decide to build him that way. Frequent use of his ultimate in a 6 trace will result in frequent activation of his follow-up attack. Obviously, you don't want to bet your chips on Aventurine being a second damage dealer for the team, but if say you're fighting a boss and bring them down to 1 HP, but it's their turn and they're about to combo you into oblivion, Aventurine's follow-up attack can intercept and finish off the boss before you explode. Another scenario would be if your target's about to unleash Armageddon on your team, but they have a tiny sliver of toughness left. You can have a follow-up attack take out that last bit of toughness. Beyond attacks, passive activations of supportive abilities can also be game-saving for runs. As mentioned before with Locha, one reason he's such a consistent healer is that any time a teammate drops below half HP, an equivalent of a skill gets triggered on that target. In other words, he can sustain your team outside of his turn. Let's say your TPS gets attacked and drops to half while also being slammed with damage over time, yet their turn is coming up next. You know for a fact, the remaining damage over time will finish them off, but Lord has passive heals used on them, saving their life and subsequently the entire run. To be fair, Huo Huo can also do this with their passive cleansing heal per turn, but the functionality is a bit different. What makes Fu Xuan arguably the best tank in the game is that she can top herself off at any moment, so long as she doesn't get one shot. And let's be real, if Fu Xuan can't survive an attack, no one can. A healer who heals 50% now and 50% whenever necessary will always be more useful than a healer who heals 100% now and 0% whenever necessary. In essence, follow-ups behave as real-time actions in a turn-based game. Reason number 3 is that follow-ups, chiefly follow-up attacks, can play into additional follow-up attacks, boosting each other's efficiency. A noteworthy instance of this that's still used today would be the Himeko Herda combo, known for how effortlessly they can tear through waves with just their talents alone. Herda's activation requirement is for enemies to drop below half HP, while Himeko's activation requirement is for three enemies to be weakness broken. Neither talent specifies that it has to be acquired through their respective owners. If Himeko brings enemies down to half HP or kills them outright, that will trigger Herda's talent, and if Herda breaks enemies, that will add to Himeko's talent. 
With this in mind, Himeko and Herda can chain into each other, basically serving as a two-part version of the hypothetical scenario I brought up earlier, where they explode wave after wave after wave after wave without even using up their turn. A veteran A6 Trace accumulates points for his talent anytime an ally uses a follow-up attack, in addition to all the other ways in which you can stack blind bet points. Pairing him up with his fellow IPC colleagues, Ratio and Topaz, only makes him that much more effective. And if I'm not mistaken, it's currently his most effective team. Based on what's been happening so far, follow-up attacks will be designed around working off each other. They hinted at damage over time going in the direction of Birds of a Feather flocking together with Kafka in 1.2, and then they hinted at follow-up attacks doing the same thing with Topaz in 1.4. At the time, Topaz wasn't really all that strong given there weren't many teammates she could pair up with other than Jinyuan, and the two aren't the most compatible. Now, not only do we have a dedicated follow-up attacker in the form of Ratio, whom Topaz can synergize with, but we also have a follow-up tank in Aventurine. The more follow-up attacks there are, the more often Numbi can attack too. So all of those follow-ups from Ratio and Aventurine mean more DPS for Topaz. Best of all, after the release of 2.2 a couple weeks ago, we now have Robin, whose A4 trace grants an additional 25% bonus damage to follow-up attacks while singing. Initially, when I reviewed Robin's abilities, I was a bit confused as to why she plays favorites towards follow-up attackers, but then I remembered her ultimate lasts only one turn cycle, and the units who can attack the most number of times during a single turn cycle, both in theory and practice, are follow-up attackers. I suppose you can equate their mutual augmentation as quadratic. Unit 1 makes Unit 2 stronger, who in turn makes Unit 1 stronger back. Unit 3 makes Units 1 and 2 stronger, and Units 1 and 2 make Unit 3 stronger. They compound on top of each other. With these factors at play, I have a feeling that follow-up teams will become a cornerstone of Star Rail's meta. Just like how Genshin has a benchmark teams like Taser, Freeze, National, and whatnot, Star Rail will have the same thing. Dot teams, follow-up teams, etc. Only if I had to guess which team is better, I'm personally of the school of thought that follow-ups have a higher ceiling. A huge limitation with damage over time is that crit stats are ineffective, and while they can most definitely pack a punch even without it, it's still a con. Plus, damage over time doesn't break toughness gauges, follow-up attacks do scale off crit, and they do break enemy toughness. That being said, follow-ups are not without their drawbacks. At its core, the mechanic can only be manipulated, not controlled. In extreme scenarios, you can reach a level of consistency to where yes, follow-up attacks can be handled to where you can activate them at will, but fundamentally, they're not as consistent as straightforward attacks. Then there's also the issue of virtually every single decent follow-up unit right now being a 5-star. Herda is the only 4-star dedicated follow-up attacker, and she's exclusively for wave battles. I think, out of all the teams in the game, follow-up teams definitely possess the highest investment floor, without question. Take the IPC team for instance, Ratio, Robin, Topaz, Aventuring. Four 5-stars, and none of them can be substituted without adding in a completely non-follow-up oriented character. I guess Vanmei's not the worst in place of Robin, but that's still a big downgrade. Also, as of 2.2, Ratio is no longer free to obtain, so any accounts created from now onwards will have to acquire him the old-fashioned way. I'm sure the majority of you watching this are not part of that demographic, but even so, objectively speaking, follow-ups are still gated behind a paywall. So I hope in the near future they make 4-star supports or follow-up attackers who can round out the roster a bit. Damage over time teams have multiple 4-star supports. We could use some extra free-to-play love for follow-up teams. I'll admit, it's interesting to see Star Rail's combat develop in the way that it has. I still think they stand to benefit from adding some more actions and things you can do in combat besides attack skill and ultimate, but to their credit, that makes their creativity and team design all the more impressive. I'm looking forward to seeing what else I'll do. For now though, feel free to share your thoughts on follow-up characters in the comments down below. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you could leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at VarsVerum, join my Discord server, and check out my other Honkai Star Wars discussion videos if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.